No, not a good idea. Okay. Not a good idea. No thumb story. You know, Mark Marin would start a podcast like that and he'd get away with it. But I could never pull that off. Yeah. You got kind of Mark Marin thing going. You guys are like, you know, stand-ins, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm the Italian version of him and he's the Jew version of me. Right? <laughs> Mark Marin. John, no, no, no beard and mustache. No mustache. No, I, I, I had an accident and I ended up looking like Adolf Hitler. Ooh. And I decided to kind of forego that facial hair forever. I was scarred. I, I overshaved. All right, guys, we're live now. Welcome, everybody, to this week's Eventide Quarantine for Gear Club. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, tell you a funny story about some moving kids that came over about a half an hour. No, wait, sorry. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I want to welcome a, a dear old friend from 19, around the late 90s, 96. Uh, done numerous records with him. Wonderful gentleman, super talent, Steve Wynn. And he's joining us, but he's also joining us with his band, uh, the members of his group called the uh, Dream Syndicate, which have reunited for the last eight years. My, my first intro was way better. Um, and joining us also are like, co I called cohorts, just people who were involved in the making of the last two records. And um, I'll hand it over to Steve at this point. Thanks, Stevie. All right, yeah, Steve. hey, John. hey, John, hey, Stuart. Hey, Steve. Hey, it's good to be here. So um, we are here for the Quarantide edition with the Dream Syndicate, The Universe Inside, which is the name of our new record. And uh, and you can see everybody here. We've got, got um, uh, keyboard player Chris Kakovis from Germany over there. I'm, I'm heading away. Yeah, There's the record. Chris has the record. Stephen oh, yeah. McCarthy um, is in Richmond, Virginia, down over there. Mm -hmm. Dennis Duck from Los Angeles. Mark Walden up in Reno, Nevada. Jason Victor across the river from me in Manhattan. I'm in Queens, by the way. And Adrian Olson, who um, runs Montrose Recording, where we made the record and engineered the record over there in Richmond, Virginia. So we got all over the place here, all different time zones and everything. Here's the story. We, th this is the, um, the third Dream Syndicate record we've made since reuniting back in 2012. We've made three records, um, released three records, I should say, and they've all been done at Montrose recording down in Richmond with, with Adrian and with John mixing the records. So this has been the team for the last few records. The new record um, was actually recorded late at night when we were making our second comeback album, a record called These Times. We had had a uh, regular normal studio day, 12 hours or whatever we would do. Is that normal? When I'm with John, 12 hours is on the short side of things. Right, light day. Yeah, but we, we were, it was like about midnight, you know, and, and we were technically done for the day. And, and Stephen McCarthy, who lives about a mile from the studio, came by to say hi. I think he had a six pack of beer, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, and, and we were gonna ha just hang out and talk, but instead we went in and decided to jam for a while. And very, very fortunately, and this wasn't the plan, very fortunately, Adrian and John pressed record and recorded what became an 80 minute non-stop jam of music that we did really just for fun. I, in fact, I'll start with the story of saying when we finished the whole thing, 1.30 in the morning, I expected those guys to be long gone. And strangely enough, you hung in there for the duration. So we, this jam became in itself, it, it was what it was, but we um, overdubbed, added things, subtracted things. And in the course of all the mixing and matching and playing around with the session became our new album, The Universe Inside. So I'm going to start off by saying, what, what at that point, John and Adrian made you decide to even press record when we were just monkeying around like that? Is that something you would would That's always the gig, right? <laughs> That's the gig. <laughs> That's the gig. <laughs> you tell him, buddy. Go ahead. Oh, you. <laughs> you go ahead. I mean, you John, I think it was all your fault because you you named you named the uh, you named the different times in the jam where you felt like there were songs, and then Steve saw that and it was over. I'm no you know. making funny names a little bit too. Yeah. That was embarrassing. I was kind of like fucking all the names. Well, that's the thing, Tony. I'll just start. I'll, I'll leave it off by saying we did do this jam till whatever time, and then we just had more beers and fell asleep as bands do. But the next morning, John got into the studio whatever time before we were all there and gave broke it up into pieces and gave them all names. And that was when the idea that well, these were actually could be songs. I think one was called. From carpenters to Noi, or from or balloons was one that um, um, 
And they were all called Stevens Jam. I think that was the overall name of every single track. Stevens Jam. Right, that was the name of the session. Stevens Jam. So Steven, did you know what you were in for when you came by him, you know, to, to say hi? Not exactly. I mean, you guys were working and it's pretty much, you, you kind of stay to the side while someone's making a record and try to not get in the way. But when you said, hey, can you hang around for a little while? Because we're going to we just want to go out and record some. And I mean, that's like pure music when you go out and play just for mu music's sake to go out. There's no preconceived ideas. There's no arrangements or anything. You're not thinking about any of that stuff. You're just like someone starts a riff. You just start playing. You're playing off of one another and you hit that crazy the helicopter pedal steve or whatever and i pick up a sitar and someone you know the bass you know guys the rhythm section is laying down an amazing groove and chris and jason i mean it's just it wasn't anything but then it was everything you know it was magic and, and how <laughs> steve, so you went off and wrote words after that yeah, here's the thing. I mean, it was it was one of the, you know we we do a lot of jamming on stage, and that's kind of kind of what this band does quite a bit. Um, and as of course, as anybody will know, it, it's not always not always golden. It's not always good. But this was a particularly good session. And I listened to, God, I listened to it hundreds of times. I played that more than any record that I've made or become a fan of. I just played it to death. And at a certain point, said I started thinking, well, you know, there could be some words here. There could be maybe a chorus here, and just on my own started fooling around with it to the point where I thought, well, I'm gonna go back down to Montrose with Adrian and spend a few days down there, end up being five days, and just sort of see what can, you know, be shaped with all this stuff. And then we, we had a great time. That was a really- Yeah, that really worked out. I'm just trying days. to find the path that made the most sense. Yeah. Um, at this point, I'd really like to give uh, Adrian props for uh, putting the mixes together. And uh, you added some, some really surprise pieces in there that blew my effing mind. And Adrian, really, man, you were on it. You Somehow you came back to that whole thing we did that night and uh, you interjected, you re-interjected that vibe. And uh, man, kudos, well done. Chris? Well, yeah. I will say every time I heard a sound and then when, when Steve and I were sifting through the multi-tracks that was the crazy, crazy as hell sound, it was, it was always coming from the keyboard tracks, so. <laughs> oh, is, that, is, is that one of the t instruments you removed <laughs> and, and, and took out of the mix? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> By the way, the interesting thing here, and I showed this before we went live, if you look over here in my home, up in the corner, I don't know if you can see it, the very top left corner there, that's the, um, the, the Maestro Rhythm King drum machine that I brought down to the session. We had sort of next to Dennis by the drum kit the whole time. And Dennis, throughout the session, when occasionally just sort of fired up and play along with it. And that started the jam, right, Dennis? That's how, you, how it all got going. Oh, yeah. We just, we had that there and we said, hey, okay, it'd be fun to uh, play around with this to see what we can do. I, I loved it. Great. It was a great tool slash toy to use. I know, uh, I know one of the beats uh, actually came from this thing. <clears throat> The Korga monologue. Oh, yeah. I worked into one of them. I can't remember which one, though. One of the more, uh, geez, I wish I could freaking remember. It gets electronic for a minute, yeah. You get a lot of stuff. I, mean, I, th I think what you said, what you said, Adrian, about the, the sound Chris was getting and all that, there is kind of a throughout, not you know, throughout the record, Mark and Dennis are just laying down an, a relentless groove, which is admirable considering you guys had been playing at that point all day right. and rock on Dennis, kudos to you. You know, you, you've been playing all day long and then play for 80 minutes straight at that point. But what's going on with the grooving that solid is Jason and Chris in particular are making sounds. I don't know what you guys are doing. I've gone back to listen to this and I have no idea. I don't know what, you know, it, I assume there's guitars in the case of Jason, keyboards in the case of Chris, but I'm dumbfounded. Do you know, could you recreate, Jason, I'll ask you, could you recreate what you did on the record? No, and I, I know that almost for a fact. But the thing is, and since we're here, and I hope this doesn't sound like a commercial, but like the, all that session, I was using that Eventide pedal, the, uh, the H9. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. And so I had my my phone, and Steve would always ask with this thing, like, "Are you going to bring that phone on stage?" And uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I would just dial up a sound, and then that would either I would either 
use it for the next 45 minutes or just keep scrolling and finding something else. And that's kind of all the sounds on the, uh, on this new record or from that, you know, a lot of the parts were inspired by that, that pedal. Um, so there's, and there's no way I, I can find out. What you, you remember what that crazy balloon sound was? No. Was it, you know what well, I'm talking I, about? You, you said that was, didn't you say that was going through the Wawa backwards? Something you'd read about? Oh, the, the, uh, the squeal thing that was, yeah, I was going through uh, a Wawa backwards and then a delay. And then, uh, so you get this, crazy high pitch squeal seagull kind of noise. Just oh, say, wah -wah say it. isn't that a yeah, it's, it's a yeah, it's a it's a wah wah. It becomes a wah wah. Wah -wah. <laughs> <laughs> hey but Steve, so were you like when John cut it up into these sections, did you adhere to those to where he started and stopped and called them you know, did you use his markations? Completely, 100%. Actually, every everything he had chopped up became the song. So the first piece, which was called Sitar Jam, maybe was 20 minutes long, and that became the regulator. And really, and I think John made his marks based on certain things that happened. Like yeah. the length of the first track is as long as Stephen was playing a choral electric sitar Mm -hmm. And when he puts down the sitar, that's when the next song begins. And you know, and, and after that next song, which is eight minutes long called The Longing, Mark went to go get some tequila to pour shots for us. That became the next track, which didn't end up on the record. That track was called, I forgot what, I think, I think Chris Loop is the third one. And that's mostly Mark pouring shots for everybody. So each person dropping out one at a time. That's the bonus track that will come out someday that is gonna be <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we, did cut, we cut an 80 minute jam down to about 60 minutes, which is what's on the record. But really the, the marks that John made, either because I was so used to hearing it that way, or because they completely were, were, were um, um, you know, instinctive and made sense, that's where the song started and finished. And there were, you know, I don't know, John, did, did, did you just... Did, sorry. You didn't, well, <laughs> no, but my thing was more like, for like the sitar, you know, they were there were stops and starts. You know, got you guys would jam, and then all of a sudden it'd be like, uh, and then something else would percolate up, and it wasn't, you know what I mean? It would it was a natural flow, so it wasn't that hard. I'll I'll never like my favorite one of my favorite moments of that night was when you went into that thing that I thought sounded like the beginning of a Carpenter song, like long ago. And it was so cool. I was like, wow, this is like a really twisted Carpenters type vibe. And I named it that, but then you went into the Noi group. You know what I mean? And that was, it was just, you know, it was just you guys doing it. And I was just, you know, I could have just said title one, title two, title three, but you know, it, it was it was a natural, natural stop and starts, I thought for the band. Well, I think, you know, you know, I play in an improv band here in Germany. <clears throat> And that's kind of the way it goes, you know, you play that that groove until it just kind of doesn't work anymore or it builds up, it finds its dynamic, it finds its peak, climaxes, then it's over, you know. And but then there's a, there's this sort of natural segue, either you get a stop, like a hard stop and move on to the next one. But in our jam, I remember there was a, a continuous sort of segue. Always, somebody's always making kind of some kind of noise in the background. Is that is that right? Do you remember it like that, John? I think so. I yeah. Think, is that true? Yeah, I don't. I don't think the noise ever stopped. That's what I mean. <laughs> Technically, it's still okay. going. It's still going. I mean, I, I've I've been doing a lot of interviews about the record, and a lot of times people say, "So, how did you decide to record a twenty-minute track? Why?" The regulator is a 20 minute track. What made you decide to lead off with? I said, well, it's not really a 20 minute track. It's just the first 20 minutes. And th this, that particular track ends, Adrian, you had the idea, I think, to put that explosion at the end of it and then start the next song. But that was just an artificial thing that, we, that makes it seem like that's the end. It really never did stop. There's no, and what's interesting about the session and uh, is that, look, again, it was late. It was the end of a long day. And we could have stopped at any point. Probably certain people might've been praying we would stop at any point. But each time we were slowing down, somebody else did something. And I'm, I'm thinking in particular, at the end of 
what on the record is called Apropos of Nothing, the third track. If you listen to that track, now bear in mind, this is probably about 40 minutes into the jam, maybe longer. And it sounds like we're done. You can hear the band kind of wanting to sort of find a resolution to what we're doing. And then Mark starts playing a bass line. Yeah. And aggressively too. I wanted to make sure it's like, no, we're not done. We're just starting, let's go. <laughs> Hell yeah. That was after the tequila though, right? <laughs> hey, Shane. You know, yes. what, I think yes. is what I think would be uh, important to mention at this point, and something that I love about this record, <clears throat> is that the songs all are presented on the record chronologically as it happened within that jam. Yes. And that's, I think that's pretty effing cool. Even though it was chopped up, you know, some things were added, I love that the chrono chronology is still intact, you know. Yeah, in fact, I, 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 it's right exactly it's chopped up, but it's not. It's not. Um, like we didn't move sections around. You're right, Chris. It's chronological. In fact, what more? What Adrian? What you did, which was fantastic, is you just would take bits and pieces from different parts of songs, and move them where they shouldn't be, and that was great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like I say, you you did were on fire during the, the during that that session last fall, where you did just had the imagination to just, you know, there were no rules. You just moved, you had, had a lot of fun copying stuff, putting it somewhere else. And that, that was exciting. Yeah, that was fun. Was How long did you guys spend on the post-production stuff, like the mixing and the overdubs? Five days, I think. Five days. Yeah. Wow. So I, take back, I take it back. Five days we spent adding overdubbing and adding vocals, and then Adrian mixed it later, and that was another three. Uh, yeah, three, three, three days, or like that. Yeah. three or five days. Right. Five days, so, five days. so is this the kind of thing that you go, okay, yeah, great. So here's a new way to make a record. Let's go in and jam. Or is it, or you can't prescribe it. It, it happened and that's like a one time thing. Like, have you considered, oh, next time instead of writing songs, let's go in and jam and make another one like that. Or, or, or is it just like it happened and that's it? Yeah, I think it happened. I mean, I think, I think this was the record for me personally that I wanted to make with the Dream Syndicate mm -hmm. since since I joined the band. It's always like, <clears throat> as you mentioned, you know, a large part of our our live thing is the improv uh, aspect, and you know, we 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 do it a lot. We do it well, and so why not capture that element um, on record? Um, but I, I'm I'm also kind of glad that it came out accidentally because then it was almost as if you know, there was no overthinking it. It was just, it was really natural. Um, and another thing which is amazing to me is that it, to me, it seemed that when, when the, uh, the rough mixes were all sent after Steve and Adrian worked on it, it seemed to me that it was the most quick and unified response from the band, all like, this is great. You know, it wasn't like all this, no, take this out here, take this out here. There was little of that much less than I thought there usually is, which was incredible to me. Yeah, it really seemed like we walked the fine line of not overthinking this record. Because at any, at any one point, like like you were saying, Stuart, if uh, if you start to be like, oh, we're just gonna jam and that'll be the next record, it's gonna be easy to be like, oh, let's just do that one again. Right. Maybe right. we can do it better. And all of a sudden, you're overthinking yeah. it. Well, it's you know, kind of we, yeah, Johnny. bonus record, right? Because we made the right. other record, and then they just had a double record sitting around. <laughs> yeah. but, no, but seriously, you could fuck around with it and just not right. be too precious. It was, it, it worked but, that way. Hey, what was, uh, so did you pitch this to the label or did the label approach you guys and say, what are you doing with all these jams? I was really, once I came back from the second session with Adrian, I was just really excited about what we were doing. And I know that our A&R man at Anti, um, Andy Calkin, is into, he, he loves a lot of, freaky outside stuff. He's very into, you know, um, um, crowd rock and African music and things like that and, and, and a lot of jazz stuff. And I, and we, he and I spent a lot of time on the phone talking about music and I thought, this is something he might like. And so I sent it to him. I said, just, you know, I want to hear it. And from the very first time he heard it, he said, this really should come out. And then we spent a lot of time on the phone about talking he would release it. And he was a cheerleader of the record from the very start. There was no doubt for him. He, hey, he, has said, he has said he feels like this is our Adam Hart mother to the next record's Dark Side of the Moon. So, right. you know, we'll see about that. That's good. No pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So guys, we just got a, a thing from Facebook and, you know, we're going to get some stuff that I'll read to you and some stuff I won't, but uh, <laughs> this one is, um, how did the dynamic change having Steven in the session? Normally there are two guitars with Steve and Jason, but in this session, you have an additional talent in the studio. Did this change the interplay with the musicians? Anybody want to take that? I mean, I don't, I don't think it did. I, I think, um, I think it, uh, it didn't, I, I should say, I don't, I don't feel like it was, uh, it made, I don't think we caused, it caused us to overthink anything or it, it was detrimental and took anything away. I thought Stephen, what he was doing just fit in perfectly. And it was another texture or melody to play off against. Um, so it, it felt easy to me. And, and you know, when you hear it back, it just, it makes complete sense. Everything is responding to each instrument. I don't know how much improv Steven has done. I know he's a fantastic player. And what's clear to me is he's a very intuitive Im improv player. You know, he definitely did it exactly right. Listen, played along, it was fantastic, you know. Steven, how, how, how did, how was it for you to fit into what was happening there? I mean, it seemed like you had no problem. Well, once again, there was there was nothing planned. There were no arrangements. So I was just trying to, to listen to what everyone else was doing, but it was this crazy wash of sound. It was like that time tunnel, like in Willy Wonka, when they're going on the boat and, and all the colors are coming at you and, and just trying to feel what the person next to you was doing. And between you and Jason, I could hear a little keyboard part. And you, you know, you react to somebody or they might react to you. And there were so many crazy effects coming, you know, live while we were putting it down. And it was just great that the rhythm was just fantastic. The rhythm section and, and everybody was just playing together. So I was just trying to fit in and just hold on for dear life, you know. Hey, so having never been down to Montrose, are you guys all in the same room? Yes. Right. And yeah. I think we even had the... What? I don't think Steve wore headphones the whole session. Yeah. And then, but Adrian, for that, didn't we open up like the, the guitar amp rooms? Or didn't we just put amps in the room? Yeah, the amps, for sure. And just let them fly. So everybody was just blasting. And we didn't even take a direct on that, on the drum machine that opens up the whole record. It's just, uh, it was it's just an amp peg, uh, Gemini, yeah. Steve's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's part Blast. of the reason why I love the way that thing sounds. It's so gnarly, right? It's not clean at all. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Remember one of the mix notes is Steve was like, I love the way it sounds. Can we dial the, the hair back like 10%? I'm like, nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you did. Yeah, we can dial it up 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so, are the drums in the same room? A good yeah, chance. Room. Another, another commercial, like Jason was saying, but it's a good chance to say a commercial for Montrose recording, which is where I've made pretty much every record I've made for the last 15 years, I think. I think I've done eight albums down there in, in recent years and just a great place to work. And I'm always, I shouldn't say I'm hesitant to say because I want, but I, 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 one of the things I want you to be as busy as possible. And I, I want, but at the same time, I want to always be able to get in when I need to work on something. So Thanks. hopefully, I, but it's a great, it's my favorite studio to work at. Just, and I've, I was trying, I've been trying to get John and Adrian together for a long time. I've just wanted that, that, that combination. And it, Steve, how did you find the studio? Um, I first recorded out there. It's a, the short version of a long story. Is I was in a band called Gutterball back in the early '90s um, with, with 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 Steve and McCarthy, with um, um, Brian Harvey and Johnny Hot from House of Freaks, and Stephen and um, Bob Roop from the Silos. Um, by the way, Stephen is in the Long Waiters. We haven't mentioned that yet, but for those of you who don't know that, we had a band called Gutterball, and was and um, um, Adrian's father, Bruce Olson, had run an I will keep. I will keep this short. But I had run, had run a studio called Flood Zone in the heart of Richmond, and at a certain point, put his focus towards raising and training horses out at his home nearby, and moved all the gear out there. And because he was a friend of the other guys in the band, he said, "Well, you could record these new songs you're working on at my in my you know in, on in my home in the horse barn, essentially. Um, actually, in the, we recorded in the slaves' quarters and." And the control room was in the horse barn. It was very ad hoc type of thing. Anyway, we um, 
that became a fun place to work. And over a period of time, and I should let Adrian take this over, you moved it all to a separate house, but with yeah. the gear that was there, right? Yeah, my dad had kind of totally gotten out of recording when I was a kid. And then I started asking questions when I was 13 or 14 and he started getting some stuff back together kind of hesitantly. And I think that that was after Gutterball, well after Gutterball, because I was, I think I made the inside cover of that record when I was just a kid. I was missing both front teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sweet. Anyway, we started getting into it and it was like we had drums and uh, like a Digi 001 in our basement. And then we just kept adding, and get, so started getting his gear back from old friends and just building a little studio. And then we ended up building this bigger building in an outbuilding together as kind of like a father-son bonding experience, mm -hmm. which is now the studio that, that I run and that he's, He's retired. So. <laughs> Does he ever give you a side eye when you put a 57 on an amp and you'd be like, come on? <laughs> maybe, maybe subtly. No, no, he's, he's good with that. <laughs> it is, no, but it is interesting, Stuart, right? Because think about it. Like, I can't have any concept of, of having my dad do what I, you know, do what I do, like in that sense, right? Like, the engineer, producers, or whatever, like, yeah, there's no, I don't know anybody else besides you and your dad who do. You know what I mean? You have that relationship. That's fantastic. Yeah. Shelly Yakis. Uh, what's that? Sh Shelly, John. Shelly Yakis. Really? Why, his son is uh, an engineer? No, Shelly's father. Oh, right. Right, OK. And there's a couple of now that I think about it. You're right. There are a couple of others. About uh, the legend, Mr. Mr. Johns. Yeah. Ethan yeah. Johns, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. Fuck, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> Ruining your story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, trying to give you, trying to make you look special. And this is what I get. Yeah. Um, no, but also I will say just from my one experience there for the few weeks we were there, I loved it there. We had so much fun. And at the end of the day, the first of the two records we made these times came out great. And it was like such a fun vibe. Mm -hmm. And we have so many great stories of pictures of us like together and the the breakfast hangs and even the evening like it was it was such a bonding and fun experience and that was just on a personal level and then musically the stuff that we created in the studio was fantastic and the studio was very conducive to giving us that vibe so i, I loved it there i had a really great time is it a residential studio or do you stay off site a residential it's like a, a band house kind of like a rancher style and then behind that's a studio See, I love that because no doubt that that contributed to the fact that you guys were able to make this record because you weren't like getting in your car and driving an hour away. You were there. And I think that's like sort of the beauty of great residential studios is that stuff happens. You know, uh, Stuart, I, I think aside from uh, just whatever travel might happen, I think it's great that the members can be isolated from whatever their normal daily life is. You know what I mean? So uh, I know that's always, I've personally always benefited from it in the past and uh, this is no exception. No. Right. Me and Mark got to share a bungalow for a couple of weeks. That was fun. That was great. Except for you, you do snore a lot. <laughs> well, you know, we could all we could all I, and I don't, I don't know if I snore as much as you do, but <laughs> that's for you to tell, not for me. <laughs> I've actually made now, I think, I think three or four records there with Chris. And among, uh, I mean, I've made a lot of records with Chris over the years and, and many reasons, because Chris is great with arrangements. He was actually the producer of the first album we made when we got back together again. So he's, he's production skills, keyboard skills. But one of Chris's main skills besides all that He's a great cook. So when you live that close to the studio, we had a full-time chef on at all time, you know. And John made some great meals. I think Dennis made a few, but Chris, Chris was rocking it. Hey, it's, so no, it's, my, it's my second passion after music. <clears throat> so, yeah. so Steve, when so the original Dream Syndicate was the early '80s, right? Early yeah. '80s. '82 we started, yeah. And and you were in LA. Yeah. And and through the years that ended that and then you had these other bands. What inspired you to 
not just start a new band with these guys, but to reignite this concept. It was a pretty spontaneous thing. Uh, in 2012, I was asked to play a festival in Spain that I really wanted to do. And to be honest, I actually asked, want to know if I want to do with my solo band or with my other band, The Baseball Project. And in both cases, I think it was actually Linda couldn't do what she was working at the time. So here, that's my wife and she was the drummer in both those bands. And I wanted the festival and it was really just kind of a spontaneous thing where I said, well, what about the Dream Syndicate? And I went back to, to Mark and Dennis. Now, it, it, Mark, we, we all stayed friends. He, um, Mark and Dennis and I had actually played together over the years, toured together, stayed friends. So that wasn't a great reach, but the previous guitarist, Paul Cutler, had remained a friend, but made it clear he didn't want to do anything like that. So Mark and, and Dennis and I liked the idea and the, the logical um, person to ask was Jason because Jason and I had been playing together my solo band at that point for 10 years. He had played all the Dream Syndicate songs over the years and really it was like, let's do this. But it was, I don't think we thought of in terms of let's reunite the band and make records and stick around for eight years, which at this point, the bands lasted longer than did the first time around. It was just, we'll take one thing at a time and see what happens. But from the very start, largely because of Jason adding so much new spirit to the band and being true to who we were, but going to new places, it was having a great time. And it wasn't until um, three years after that, maybe uh, 2017, where we had been touring at that point quite a bit, playing the old songs. And we started, we said, if we're going to keep doing this, we need new songs. So we went down to Montrose to record a bunch of songs with the idea of, one of two things will happen. This will either work really well and we'll put it out, or if it doesn't, we're done. But it went great. Awesome. And, and, and the funny thing about the session we did when we went back to make this first record after reuniting was, as I said before, we brought over Chris to produce it because Chris goes way back with us. He's got great ideas. He, we knew he'd kind of keep us, you know, invigorated, creative, but also, you know, it would make it easy for us to do our thing without worrying about what we were doing. But the funny thing is Chris was in the control room with Adrian while we were recording out in the studio and unbeknownst to us was playing keyboards in the control room to our, to our recordings. And we didn't hear them back until we came in the studio. And in particular on the title track, this 11 minute song called How, um, How Did I Find Myself Here? We came back in to listen to what we had done and heard this wild Fender Rhodes, right? It was a Wurlitzer. A oh, Wurlitzer. Wurlitzer, yeah. It's like, what the, what the, you, were, you were playing the whole time? And I think that's when Chris became a member of the band full on. I heard that jam and I, I told Adrian, I said, there's no effing way I'm not playing on this tune. <laughs> there's no effing way. So he so, picked things up pretty quickly, a fuzz, a wah, and a Wurlitzer, and then there it went. We couldn't, we, we, we didn't hear it while you were doing it. We were just doing our thing and right. not, unaware of it. But when, you, but when the, the, the original records in the 80s, were they like real 80s records, you know, done of its time, oh, yeah. produced in nice studios and... Oh, yeah. Well, I take it back and, and, and I'll let Dennis and Mark weigh in on this, but our, well, the first record, Days of Wine Roses, we made at a studio in East Hollywood called Quad Tech, where we were on Slash Records and a lot of the bands recorded there. We had no budget. We recorded that record midnight to eight, three consecutive nights. That was what we had booked. That's, that's when it was cheap to get in there. So we recorded pretty much the entire album in one night, midnight to eight the first time. The second night I came in and did vocals and we mixed the whole thing on the third night. And that's the Days of Wine and Roses. That, that's, you know, so that was not 80s in any way. That was just get it on, right. get it on tape and be done with it. And then we went full on 80s after that with Medicine Show. We spent six months making that record, three days for the first record, six months for the next one. And Mark joined the band shortly after that. And we made a third album, which continued the, the, the drum sound the, 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 of the, you know, we had the drum sound going. And was, it's, I've ragged on that record, but it's a good record. But we were kind of ca caught in that whole, you know, that thing of making piece by piece. We went out, our last record we made before breaking up was called Ghost Stories. And I think we went back at that point to just playing as a band. Would, would you say that was a little less of the 80s production thing, guys? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. And you guys made a record with Sandy Perlman. That was that was a, that was the six month record. Yes, <laughs> I had a feeling that was the six month one, which he was kind of known for doing. Um, yeah. I 
I'll just before, before I get back to that question, but um, Sandy was great. I really thought Sandy was a very interesting guy with great ideas and exciting to work with. And but he was exhausting because he was always chasing something. And we did that. You know, we did that record, <clears throat> twenty four track tape. And typical thing was he would record a bunch of things, bounce them down to one track, fill up all the tracks, bounce it down over and over and over. It was just, you know, I mean, I, I, did, I did vocals on an eight song record for six weeks, seven days a week. No fun. No. Horrible. The whole thing was a horrible experience, but I liked the record and, <clears throat> you know, I'll never do it again, but it was a good experience. Right. But Mark and Dennis, after, after because I will, I will say after the Sandy experience, again, not ragging on because I like what came out of it, I vowed to never to do that again. And I think that, you know, I haven't. We, right, we spent six, six weeks on the next two records. Am I, am I right? Yeah, it's something like that. From, uh, from uh, beginning yeah. to end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got into that point where it's uh, out of the gray where we were on the SSL board mixing and all the, you know, the very 80s sounding, uh, digital reverbs and everything else that was coming out. So it, it suffers because of that. And it is very 80s, but uh, it, I think we played very well on it. I, and I, I hope someday those masters reemerge so we can remix it. <laughs> I think Adrian, you would do a great job on that. Or do, you ever play the, do you ever play those songs live? Oh yeah, we do. I mean, all the old, all the old, old records, we, we play a good, percentage of all those songs. We did the fourth album actually with Elliot Mazur um, and we, uh, our, our final album before breaking up, Ghost Stories. And Elliot was great for us because Elliot was all about, he would actually was, was with us in the in the studio when we were recording, kind of conducting us, dancing along, waving his arms around. And it kind of got us back into the vibe of playing together as a band. Mm. That, that, that was a more fun record to make. But you know, since then, you know, we went from to, to be, because the stat freak that I am, we made a record in three days, a record in six months, a couple six week records. Well, since reunited, we've made the last few records. How did I find myself here was done, I think five days of tracking these times, 10 days of tracking, but we managed to record this new album at the same time. So that was, it's more fun that way. I definitely prefer that. Uh, so, what about a live record? Uh, have you... That'd be great. We, we, we did um we did a, a a live record back in '88 called Live at Rogers that was uh, that Elliot produced. But this band would make a great live record. I mean, I'm dying to take this record out on tour and play it live with with Stephen, um, with with a horn player Marcus Tenney from Richmond played great horns in the record. It'd be fun to do this record on stage someday. <laughs> Who knows when, but someday. Mm -hmm. How are you guys all coping with the uh, not being able to play live and stuff like that? What's everybody doing? Okay, uh, I, I um, been working remotely because I have a full time job, of course. That they reduced to uh, twenty percent of my uh, income, and uh, one week every month I'm furloughed. So that's always fun. It gives me time to go out and uh, paint in my entire inside of my house. I have re-cemented a whole planter that surrounds a tree in my backyard. I did that this week. So I, I've been very productive. I've been trying to do as much as I can do and keep up uh, with things. But I, I, I really am bummed that we can't go out and play the record. And, and I wish that we could at least even get together and just uh, play uh, and do something live through this kind of a medium. But that's impossible to do yeah. until we can get a, a nice, simple recording process. But uh, I, I don't know, what do you think, Dennis? Do you wanna go out and play live? Or you just wanna sit in your apartment all by yourself? <laughs> no, let's get out there tomorrow, please. <laughs> so ready. I've been dying to play this record. I've been dying to rehearse it, figure out how I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be a challenge, but it's gonna be a really beautiful challenge. Um, no, I'm absolutely ready to go right now. Because, because, because of the nature of the jam of it, the jamness, is it the kind of thing where you guys think you'll just start at the beginning of each piece and then go wherever you want? Or are you guys going to try to rehearse it so you do the same thing every time? I think we, we, we want to learn the record. I think we all, agree, we all agreed on that. 
Is that right? Am, am I am I yeah, speaking? I, I think there's key parts that just need to be there. I I think um, we wouldn't want it to get so. I don't know. There's so much that can happen badly <laughs> with it. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, this is how they usually sound, kind of thing. Um, you just happen to capture it on a good day, a good night. Um, I think there's parts of it that we would just have to learn, and then, and then hopefully, knowing the general idea of it, then maybe, then letting room to to grow and breathe from that aspect. I don't. I don't think we cannot yeah. not do what we do in improv I, I think that's you know i don't think we're good at like this is it this is it just the structure i think naturally it would come to it would move to other areas which is great but we have to know what we're doing in the first place. yeah we need to we need to go back and learn it for ourselves find out what the touch points are of every each of the songs you know get a get comfortable enough with it that we can play around with it within that structure so that all the songs are recognizable, but we're still improvising within that within that structure, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Dream Syndicate, <laughs> any, even when Dream Syndicate is playing songs off of these times or off of How Did I Find Myself Here, there are opportunities where we're improving within the song, okay? So these are songs, and but we're still improving. Now we played an improv but they've been turned into songs. They are songs. They have a certain structure. They have verses and kind of choruses, less choruses, but you know, they're definitely parts, you know, so it's, we can't just kind of go out there, cop the groove and hope it happens. You know, uh, Marcus is, is going to have to know when to come in. We're going to have to make space for him. <laughs> yeah, dog. Somebody's going to have to sing the la, 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 la. Well, that's that's uh, Stephen's responsibility. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you know you know I'm right. <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, I, as far as me, I you know I I I totally just groove, and I, I'm going to groove no matter what we do when we play it live. I think you all are more concerned about your specific parts because you don't even know exactly what parts you played. I know exactly what I played on the record because it's obvious what. I yeah, that, that's part of it. That is part of it. I do have to figure out what the hell I played. Like Jason, I can't, I can't figure out my parts, but I did figure out Jason's parts. So, uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit ahead of the game there. Um, but, so you um, can teach well, Jason then, right? <laughs> I mean, actually, if, it wasn't, if it wasn't for where things were panned, I wouldn't know who's playing what half the time. I only know, like, well, this must be Stephen because it's sort of center right. That's got to be him. And if it's over on the left, it must be Jason. But besides that, I would not. There's stuff I wouldn't. There are things I play on there that don't sound like me at all, which is, it was. It's, but Steve, Steve, you still have to check your cheat sheet, right? Wait, okay, who's panned left? You're like listening. <laughs> hey, uh, looking at Mark, I'm reminded of the really nice companion film that goes with this record. And uh, Steve, did you want to mention that at all or talk about that at all? The that's a good point, Steve. And yeah, we we've we, there is we have a, a a guy in Scotland named David Dalgleish who um has done all our videos for the last two records, and he made a series of videos for each of the songs on on the Universe Inside for all five tracks. Full beautiful videos. They're 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 up on YouTube and all that. Easy to find. And tomorrow, yes, tomorrow we're going to be putting up the entire hour long movie as one video clip on YouTube. So it, they go well together. Actually, if you listen to the record and see the visuals, it's pretty trippy. Yeah, it's, like, pretty fantastic. It's, like, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, with, with, with the record sort of thing. It's insane. I can't believe he did the whole thing. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it's funny because he came down to Berlin to see us. We've never met him before last year. He flew down to, to meet us and to, to, to watch us play. And before the show, we were talking, Steve started trying to convince them, hey, we've got this album that we're trying to put out. It's kind of a weird thing. It's got a long, the first song is really long, it's 20 minutes. Uh, and, and, and I knew that's where he was going. And I, and I instead wanted to get a little more selfish and I kind of blurted out and sort of took over the conversation and said, no, we actually would like you to do the whole album. <laughs> and, and 
Steve kind of looked at me like, are you crazy? But I kept on it. And he says, no, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. And so he one by one just took them and made you a piece. Like you're in the video, Mark. I, I am. Your background. <laughs> well, this actually is from uh, Blacklight. Blacklight. Um, these times. Yeah. 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 I recognize it now. Which is an amazing video. Like, it's uh, a great video. I just happened to have this clip, so I thought, well, it's, it would be a fun background. So, but he's a very talented uh, videographer. Uh, I, I, I like, I like that this record took us literally 80 minutes to make. You know, that we, it took him about six months to make the video. So, you know, he had a hard, harder, harder time of it than we did. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember how much fun it was, really, because we, I think me and Adrian, we were just sitting in the, in the control room, like, like drinking tequila, right? Yeah. I mean, and we were just checking this shit out, and it was fun. It wasn't, you know, you would say, ah, oh, we worked a long day. Ah, oh, great. Now they want a jam. What a nightmare. But no, it was really fun. And I oh, think yeah. the, the, the reason that it was so much fun, like I said, that's why I kind of started getting into labeling shit, because it was really like we were just hanging out. And there would be a, a various cameos. Did a couple of your friends show up while they were jamming? Didn't a couple show up that you were friends with? They yeah, came my, friend, my old drummer, or Tyler Williams, showed up. He's in that band, The Head and the Heart. And we were just hanging. I think we played Hanging, it was great. You we know? were hanging, like, like drinking. Party. Yeah, yeah, like a party with a live band playing. Right. <laughs> Go figure. We were the entertainment. Yeah. Sure was, you were in, you did well. <laughs> Hey, so as long as we're on the, the subject here, just from Facebook, and this is, kind of touched on the other thing, but in, in terms of like the execution of the jam, the question that the, someone has asked is for Mark and Dennis, how is it different writing, which I kind of would imagine was just playing, bass and drum parts in the jam session environment versus coming up with parts to songs that were brought in to the group uh, by Steve. W were you guys like focused on each other or were? I, I, I personally just love to play. And, and sometimes when there's a very hard or rigid, this is how the song goes, I, 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 I want to break out of it. Because Steve tends to write three chord songs, usually in D. Um, and I, I'm used to that, and I, and I, I kind of wanted to play all the secrets. <laughs> I, I didn't want to play what I normally would play with a Steve typical song. I wanted to just do what I naturally do. And Dennis, I think, did this same thing. You know, he he played stuff he's I've never heard him play on an album ever before. So, yeah. and and of course, maybe the drum machine helped lend, you know, a foundation that he was able to play looser on, uh, and I was able to just play whatever I felt like, and it just yeah, made but, sense. You know, we were playing off the riff of a guitar thing, and then I that would send me one direction, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think I would have ever played any of that kind of stuff on a typical dream. Would you Would you yeah. guys say you all have? Um, collectively similar references and things that you like? Or does everyone come from a different place or? I, I think we all share a lot of the same. I mean, some of us are more Velvet Underground or more punk or more, you know, whatever. But I think we all have a, a similar uh, background, except for Jason, because he likes ACDC and, <laughs> or uh, Kiss or, uh, Rush. Those are the bands that I can. Yeah, I, I was waiting for that. Rush. I was waiting for Rush. <laughs> well, I, oh, I should mention, you know, before we went in to record these times and, and this record as well, a lot of the prep work was done by Steve sending us all out links to stuff he was listening to, things. He, hey, check this out. This uh, Af an African uh, band or something, or, hmm. or a Miles Cut or something, or Canner. I don't know, a lot of just different interesting things that all had something in common, which is just that they were sort of outside, rhythmic, just cool, uh, vibey, moody. And I mean, that was kind of, for me, that was the album prep work, just hearing all that stuff that Steve sent out. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe even unconsciously kind of brought us to a similar space when we got there. At least did for me. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that, oh, wait a second. 
What happened? We're back. I lost you guys for a second there. I think yeah. I think it's some of my battery's dying. So I'm gonna plug. I'm gonna. Um, I, I was gonna say that I've worked on a couple of records where the artist or I did a playlist for um, people too, and and it really is fun because it like it gets the references going and it gives people it puts people in a certain just a certain vibe, which I think is a nice thing because then you're all talking about. Well, you're, you're at least understanding what everybody else is listening to, and, and, and it's a common thread, I, you know, especially if it's not just like one thing, you know, if it's a varied, um, a varied playlist. There was one record really quick that I, I referenced this In Excess song that I really, it's like my favorite, and I referenced it just in the playlist as to, particularly to one song that we were going to work on. And everybody got why this song should drive more and just be more moving from this in excess song. We didn't necessarily steal any of the chords or any of the vibe. It sounds, it's a totally different song, but they understood emotionally, you know what I mean? What this song should be like. Right. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking too, uh, one of the things that I remember that, that Steve turned us on to was that Jay Dilla record, I think it was Donuts. It was just this, crazy freaky mashup collage i don't know you know semi-hip-hop sort of thing it's brilliant and i think i don't hear that too much in these times but, but i really hear it a lot in the new record in a way mm -hmm. uh, i think adrian had a lot to do with that too the way adrian the way you mixed it the way you put parts together and uh you know kind of legged it together <laughs> i don't know uh, it's it's so beautifully done i mean yeah, it's, anyway. a lot of, it's a lot of fun to approach a project when it's you feel like you can kind of throw the, the rules out the window. It's not like at these these precious songs that Steve had labored no. for 10 years. It's like, well, let's make something together. And it's 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 fun, yeah. especially when I got the call from Steve to cut the regulator down to like a, a radio single. And you're being really ruthless. It's like was 20, it like 12 minutes minute. now? <laughs> it was like three Four and minutes. a half. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say with the regulator, I was going to, I guess Steve is getting recharged, but I was going to ask him if he remembers how that song got to be 20 minutes long. And uh, my, my answer is that it, it was close to 25 minutes. We cut it up and it's out of it. I don't know if you remember that again. <laughs> oh, yeah, we kept on trying to, I think that was the first day of St Steve and, and Steve and I in the studio. We kept on, it's like, okay, we're going to work on the regulator. And we, we kept on trying to cut it down, but every time we tried to cut it down, we would listen back and be like, no, nah, it was better long. Yeah. So I think that's as short as we could get it, 20 minutes. So glad you kept it that way. <laughs> I'd like to echo what Dennis was saying earlier about, about the studio and, and Adrian and John also, like just the great, the sonic qualities of this album, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. The it's It's strong and it's tight and it's loud and, then it gets quiet in places and if you listen to it i said this before but if you listen to this album really quietly you can hear the bass drum still you can hear the bass guitar you can hear the keyboard so good work yeah. you guys and, and the studio is adrian studio i mean i am a fan I, I live near here but we've all recorded in new york and we've all recorded in, in london and we've all recorded in la and i'll put this studio up against any of them yeah it's yeah. great it's a great room i do love it um, hey, Adrian, you know what I love about the record also, because I listened to it, you know, I got the vinyl, but also I listened to it on um, the uh, sharing systems. And it doesn't sound, you know what I mean? It sounds so natural. So the stuff you did, like, it, uh, it, it's seamless, which is great. You know, it, like it, everything cuts. flows. Yeah. So nice Top. work, buddy. Top it, man. Yeah, no, it's great. I really, <laughs> I listened to it through the first, uh, the week it came out. And I was like, holy, because I had not listened. You guys have been working on it. I hadn't listened to it since we tracked it that night. Right. And um, I was like, holy shit, this is cool. So. so so just to go back to Dennis for one second. So you were saying that Steve was sending you stuff to listen to, but it was right. in ref but it was in reference to the other songs that you were gonna do for the record. Yeah, right? it was well, it was for that session, for that recording. Right, it was session. for that session, but it was not for this. It just happened to inform this jam. Right. Because right. the jam, we didn't know the jam would exist until it, right. until it, so. 
no, it was for these times pretty much, but uh, I think even more so it, it informed the, the jam itself, really, at least in my mind. And, and I hear it in the mixing, I hear it in the production. Uh, all the, like all the reference point that's, point that Steve turned us on to, I think, really came together. A, a lot of them came together in this particular record beautifully. I mean, it's been nice reading all the things people are saying about the record and all the reviews. Because, you know, a lot of times when people review your band, you get the same comparisons all the time. Of course, we get the Velvet Underground and we get, you know, certain other things pretty often. I'm sure Steven's heard plenty of Graham Parsons and, and things like that for the long writers. And you, you, do, you, you, hear, you hear the comparisons that don't take a lot of imagination. On this record, all the comparisons of reading are things like my 70s and, and, um, and Fela records and all these things that we really like, um, Noi and Can, all these things that makes me happy because it's stuff we, it's actually the things this record's been compared to is sort of the intersection, the Venn diagram center of the music we all really dig. So that, that, that says we were having fun and kind of in a, a very subconscious place. I think that, you know, the whole, the Jay Dilla thing, which got mentioned maybe a little too much for my taste at a certain point. The thing I liked about that, that record and got me excited about it was it felt like a soundtrack, like a collage of different things put together by DJ, which is what it is. I mean, that, that record, <clears throat> record I just can't say enough about, it feels like more like a DJ's late night radio show than a, an artistic record. And when we made these times, I was saying, well, if we have a lot of different kinds of elements, some things built around loops, some things built around sequencer patterns, some things just rocking out and just throw them all together so they feel like they're like some wild mad radio show, that'd be a lot of fun. So in a way, the, uh, the universe inside is the radio show within the radio show. It's kind of, it's the, the little commercial break, you know, and now, you know, a word from our sponsors on, on acid. <laughs> I like yeah. it. Yeah, back to programming. <laughs> I also, one thing I also just said, it's funny about the record when we were talking about learning to play it like it is on there. There's a lot of stuff on the record that was artificially created by Adrian. I think on almost on every song, there's some point in a song where things go haywire and go crazy where you would think we were doing that, and we didn't. You listen to, really, The Regulator, Dusting Off the Rust, and Apropos of Nothing, three of the songs, there are kind of sections where, I don't know, I remember you had something going on there where you, I can't, you have to, I won't even guess, what were you putting everything through something else? And oh yeah, I ran the whole mix through uh, one of those Ibanez AD202 delay and a flanger. <laughs> Steve wanted to, we wanted to see how weird we could get it. And I was like, oh Dude, yeah. That is, that is odd, got it. <laughs> and I then when I started, yeah, I think the whole mix turns into that for a minute and then it comes back to the band. Yeah. Love that. Beautifully. So now we have to learn how to play that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, you have to take Jason with you. Take Adrian. Take Adrian. Sound man's got to do that. Yeah, just put a flanger on the mix. <laughs> so, so speaking of like moving forward what's uh, everyone thinking like uh how's as john said before how's everyone doing um looking forward you know i'd love to make another record and when can we do that when you know when what's everyone yeah hey, Dad, are people starting to talk to you about going into the studio to make records at this point yeah, um, we've been taking it, we've been really careful. Um, a good friend of mine from college, songwriter who lives out in L LA came and we did, we did like three weeks together, but then we're kind of leaving a week before anyone else comes on either side. We're being very careful. This band um, that I've worked with for a couple records is gonna come next month and write for three weeks and hopefully we'll leave with the record, but yeah, it's uh, but it's but kick, starting back Adrian, up. Adrian, define careful. Uh, define careful, not not doing one-off sessions, wearing masks, uh, being socially distant when possible, you, and kind of you, like agreeing to quarantine together while we're together. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you? Um, is it okay for someone to come in the control room? We have done that, yeah. Right. But 
So I guess it's not as careful as we could be. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I have the same, you know, it's, it's, you know, eventually we're all going to move forward in some way. And right. being smart about that is, you know, I, for the first time today, um, I left my house and I got in the elevator and I didn't have my mask. Mm -hmm. And th there's a policy, you know, in my building it's by law, th there's a note from the governor that you have to have your mask. And I got in the elevator and I went, holy fuck. If this door opens and someone's there, what do I do? So I just immediately took this shirt off and wrapped it around my face. And there was a woman who like, was like, whoa, that, you know, like you should get a mask. She kind of looked at me like, you should really get a mask. <laughs> and, um, but it, I really, I think it just happened because I was loosening up in my mind, like, mm -hmm. And it's no, it's and when I got in my car, I was like, "Fuck, that was no good." Yeah, it's a weird, such a strange time. There's Johnny. <laughs> well, well, again, I, as I told you all earlier, I I flew up from Las Vegas today to Reno, and I had I had to take a flight, and I've, right. I I hadn't left my house really in two months. Right. So Literally. you know that was kind of a strange, uh, you know, and adventure. Uh, <laughs> Are you supposed to quarantine after that? Is there any common well, sense? I think we will be, uh, you know, uh, my wife has, we, we've been quarantined as a family, four of us at least, uh, for the whole time. And uh, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, but it's nice to be able to know that we're home together and that we're all safe and, and feeling good. Right. But yeah, now now coming back, yeah, I think we will probably have to quarantine again, you know, uh, as we had been doing. But How crowded over was the from plane? Scratch. Sorry? How crowded was the plane? It was about half full. Oh, half full. Yeah, yeah. It was it was busier than I thought it would be. But uh, you know, originally I sat down. There was you know, a guy sitting in a row, and I'm like, wait a minute. I thought you're supposed to have the middle aisle open. She goes, well, we'll move you. I said, well, that's my son. <laughs> well, we'll move both of you. I said, no, I paid for the upgrade to sit here. Why don't you move him? And the guy went, well, yeah, my brother's in the other seat across the aisle and those are empty. They, she said, okay, fine, you can move. Wow. <laughs> it was kind of strange that she you know, kept saying, I'll move you, I'll move you. Said, well, wait a minute, I paid for this seat. I upgraded to the seat. Uh, how big is your live room? Just out of curiosity. Um, I think it's like 20 by 30, something like that. 20, 20 by 34, something like that. It's bigger than that, isn't it? I think it's a little bigger than that. I want to it? say it's bigger than that. So I'd say so too. Yeah, I think it's bigger. With, it's, uh, with all the equipment you have in there, it makes it look smaller. Yeah. Adrian, Adrian what do you know? It's your room. How would, yeah, you, know. How would you know? <laughs> but you could go boat, right? You could build little environments for people. Yeah, I mean, but then they still have to get it out of the room. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, I, think, I think what we had with the way that we're thinking of it is, again, not having people in for one day only, you know, longer sessions. So it's not a big hassle and leaving gaps between sessions. So we don't have to sanitize every cable and headphone so that there's right. like a three to five day period. And I mean, that feels relatively responsible if we're going to get back to work. I don't know. Have you heard about uh, a couple of people I know which studios are buying these UV wands and they're oh. like sanitizing like the consoles with UV, mm. you know what I mean? How does that work? UV light. I don't know. It's like, it seems insane, but I know a guy I know just ordered two and that's how he's going to basically sanitize the control room. Yeah, you could also a nice bulk erase the tapes while he's at it. What tapes? Where are you? Were you 1950? Hey. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry. That happens every now and then with me and him. Yeah, I know. Um, but and and touring obviously is on hold, right? Yeah, I. It, uh, when, when can we, who knows when we can do that again? Every, when people talk about playing in clubs and they talk about, all people are, talk about is 
well, they sell it, you know, a quarter full and people set apart. Well, what about, you know, bathroom getting going, you know, people setting up the stage and the bar and all that kind of stuff. There's so much to it. I think playing outside would be the next logical thing. Doing, doing shows for smaller crowds outdoors. And I've been looking into that. But it's sad because, you know, we've all, our whole lives, we've all been in many bands doing this, touring, being in clubs. And until there's a vaccine, I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? I don't know. You know, I've been thinking about um, just historically, um, the Spanish flu in, in, you know, 1918 and 1919. And then I thought the other day, I thought, well, hmm, Spanish flu and then the Roaring Twenties. And it's almost like, well, yeah. the Roaring Twenties were an answer for people just being locked up for two years and everybody getting sick and a lot of people dying. And then once, once the, they figured out the flu was over, people went crazy. And I feel like once they come up with a vaccine, um, I think people are gonna be itching to go see you guys play or see any, you know, go to shows and go out. I think it's, I mean, people are doing it now without a vaccine, like in the Ozarks and they're nuts. But, mm -hmm. but the point is that I think once it's safer and maybe with masks and maybe 50% or 70% capacity, I think it's gonna be, you guys are gonna, it's gonna be crazy. People are gonna be itching to go see shows. So I think, I just think, you know, you gotta, it sucks. You gotta be patient. Yeah. It was never my forte. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, Jason, what do you think? You're 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 generally a, a more the careful side of you and me. I, you, I'm more impulsive. You you bring you me mean, the reason. You you I'm an empty kind of person. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But, but I think what do you do you think this will be able to tour, play shows again sometime soon, or what? I mean, I mean, I I guess I'm of the mind as others have said. Like once the vaccine's out, I don't see a viable way to do it before then i mean as as a music fan if, if my favorite band is coming into town in the next two months i wouldn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. going to see them and i'm sort of gauging it like that and also the other thing i was thinking about you know something uh, that we do and a lot of bands do is is after you play you go sign merchandise you meet the fans you talk to them and I was just thinking about that the other night. You know, that's, that's a big part of, of touring. Um, it's a nice way to, to communicate with, with your fans and speak with them. And, and, and so how is that going to work? You know, it's one thing when you're on stage and you're almost, in a way, automatically social distance from them. But what about when you go to the merch table after and you're signing the CDs and the records? How, how is that going to work? Well, also, you got to get to the gig. You know, all you guys are going to be, you know, in a van or a bus, or that's got to be, you know, a tricky situation. Well, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, like, okay, so we could determine before a tour, we could each take our own COVID nineteen test. Then the band is clear if we have it or not. So if all that, you know, now you got this group. So okay, we're good then I hope it doesn't get to the point where it's like a ET phone home, you know, where the band is so clean that we have to walk through this, you know, tunnel to get into the club, this sterilized tunnel that takes us onto the stage and we play behind the plexiglass screen. I mean, that's just ridiculous. This is not a future I want, uh, nor can I imagine. Right. Yeah, and, and as you say, the hotels, I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean unless you're just in a, a bus and you don't shower for a month. <laughs> like, like a regular tour, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the truck stops that hurt, you know, that worry me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like I say, I, I, I was supposed to do a, um, a house concert tour in the States in April. I was really excited. It was all booked up every day for two weeks. And I was excited about it. And of course, I had to cancel it. But I started kind of approaching the people who were going to put on the show saying, well, most people who do these house concerts have houses, which means they have front lawns and they have, you know, um, backyards. And I think feasibly you could get to the point where I say, OK, I'm going to play your front lawn at 4 p.m. on Friday and everybody should drive there, walk there, whatever, stand far and apart. And I drive up in a car, get out of the car, 
play acoustic with no amplification or maybe a small little battery powered app, play for people one hour, one hour later, get back in the car and take off. You know, no need for, you know, hopefully people can hold their pee long enough to, to watch that or whatever. But Jason's right, I couldn't talk to people afterwards or hug people or do anything, but at least you could, you could, could show up and rock out and leave. And that, that might be a first step to, you know, to doing this. I don't know. Drive, drive by house concerts. <laughs> lawn concerts. Lawn concerts, yeah. Stay out of my, get, get on my lawn. Get Stay on my lawn concert. Get yeah, off my lawn. Like a, like a drive-in movie, but with a, a rock show. And drive that's, cool. that's an idea. I love that idea. That's an idea. I think they're doing like, that. They started doing that in Karlsruhe, here in where I'm living. Um, they started doing drive-in theater again. It's pretty cool. They found like a, a place where they set up uh, like conventions and circuses and stuff. And they put up a big screen and they just invite people to drive their cars up and uh, watch watch the movie. Tune it down on your radio, you know. We're right. doing that here and in the States love it. too. They freaking love it. Because uh, drive-in theaters were never a big thing in Germany. Yeah. Well, why don't we just get to the point where we're doing a, just a 3D, you know, virtual concert instead? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm doing one of those tomorrow commercial break. I'm doing, I'm doing one of those live, a live show from my apartment tomorrow. And I know people are doing it and I like them. And I'm glad that there's something to do. Of course, it's not the same. And I don't want to say that the day before I want people to watch me do it because I think it will be fun. But the reality is it's, you know, we all vibe off each other and the audience and what happened to us that day and some joke we were telling backstage before we went on all those things play into it. and that's you can't get that unless you're doing it the way we've always done it yeah am i wrong am i my you know my my no you're absolutely oh, you're right. right you're 100 right so i think we just got to be patient you know let this shit pass i mean and then yeah, there'll be a vaccine eventually next yeah. year maybe yeah Another example. I saw. I saw the other day. I saw the lineup for 2021 Primavera. Man, it looks good. It does. I saw that too. Hell yeah. I. I uh, you know. Mm, I hope. Man, that would be so much fun. I mean, this this year was looking pretty good too. I can't remember. They probably have some of the same bands. They probably pushed a lot to 2021. Right. This year is looking damn good. But next year is looking pretty awesome too. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chris, so so is Germany as locked down as we are here? No, Germany is much more <clears throat> regulated. And uh, so there are certain, the certain rules that went into place recently were the, the mask rule, of course, in public transportation, which still runs, and in any uh, shops that are open. Now, in in the beginning, it was just like uh, grocery stores, gas stations, and I forget what else. Uh, were restaurants open? No, not all restaurants. Oh, restaurants could do takeout. They could do takeaway. But recently, they opened it up. So now, like, hairdressers are open. And, uh, like, the smaller shops, like a clothing store can be open now. But again, the mask, if you're in the shop, it's, it's uh, mandatory you wear a mask. Sure. Now, so there's that. But then the other thing is like, they regulate um, how many visitors you can have and from how many households. So like if you're at home and let's say you can be a family of five, you can meet another household of two people. Okay, but they can only be from that household and they can be no more than two. Wow. So they're doing it like, you know what I mean? So they're doing it incrementally. Right. Right. So recently they opened, uh, they also opened beer gardens again, which of course is uh, heaven for, well, not just me, but most Germans, other Germans. I'm not German. Okay, whatever. So uh, they opened beer gardens again, which is great. The weather's perfect for it. The thing is, when you go to the beer garden, you don't have to wear a mask. The servers are all wearing masks. 
uh, but you have to list all your information where you are, you know, you have to give your, uh, your passport information, where you live, name, everything. So if any event happens there, they can let you know, oh, you might be infected or you might be the one who infected the people. Right. So it's pretty, you know, it's strict regulations. Um, I live near a, a small creek and there's constantly people jogging, biking, walking, uh, families of five with their children splashing around in the water. I'm okay with it. I mean, with the outdoor thing, I'm, I'm a little less paranoid. For me, it's more about uh, closed spaces, whether it's a market or a bar, et cetera, or public transportation. Sure. You know, I still take the tram every now and then, rarely, and, uh, and I don't actually like to do it, but, you know, I'll do it and I'll put the mask on. The cool thing is, like, uh, before the trams had, would have so many wagons and they'd be, like, packed. But now, for every tram, they've added, like, two more wagons. So you can really spread out, you know. So since this has happened, every time I've been on the tram, uh, I can easily find minimum uh, two meters distance from person to person. So, you know, I, I think they're paying attention there. I think they're doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been on the subway, you know, this whole time. I thought about it at some point, but I think we're going to take a, a lift into Manhattan maybe this weekend, which is something that, you know, I've, I've heard there, I don't know if, you know, Jason, I guess they have um, plexiglass in all the lifts now. So you're separated from the driver. So we're kind of thinking, well, maybe it's almost time to maybe, you know, because we're, we haven't left our, the mile around our apartment, you know, in, in course of three months or whatever. It feels like that, you know, we're starting to expand our horizons a little bit just because we want to do things. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because everyone being all over in different places, it's really a very different experience for everybody based on where you are. I mean, Jason, and Steve, and myself, we're in New York, you know, the hot zone. Definitely. And, you know, you talk to people who are like, you know, have country houses They're you know, they're just living. They're not really their not daily life is not as changed as ours. Right. A little yeah, bit of a here, disconnect. Here. John Stewart, are you guys are you guys working? Is there work? Uh, I, I'm working. Um, but mostly by myself, like yeah. mixing stuff that I had done beforehand. I've done a few little sessions, <laughs> one, two people at the most was, and it was, you know, really, you know, I, I got kind of nervous about it, you know. Sure, yeah, definitely. And, and I knew them, that they're very close friends, but it was, you know, I had set it up where the doors are open, you don't have to touch anything, everything was disinfected. They went into the room. The reason why I ask you about the control room is because I just said, yeah, you know, you'll listen to the playback when I send it to you. <laughs> you know, but actually that's a good one right yeah, that that's going to come in handy yeah, really. yeah you can't come with the control in fact i'm not even going to send it to you um, but um it comes, there, out. It comes out in august yeah. and but john is going in to make a record like a real record yeah i'm going to nashville um next week but but a couple of weeks ago so i did three weeks of mixing um in april oh. Uh, wait, in no late April, early May, but I found a place in a town called Graham, North Carolina, which is like an hour away. It's a barn in the back of this guy's house. He has like 10 acres. And I had seen it a year ago when we moved down here. <clears throat> I did a, a search of studios and, um, you know, spent a day driving around. But this guy, he has a console, like a Neve, um, uh, a newer Neve. Um, I guess they're called AES consoles. I forget, but it's a newer need. It's very good. Um, uh, Augsburger monitors. But I just recently mixed a new Dinosaur Junior record there. And it was a situation where we had to mix the record, but they wouldn't let me in the house, you know, because of the pandemic. So um, we basically, yeah, I mixed. I drove an hour, sat in this barn alone, mixed for eight hours, nine hours. Um, and then left and then we finished and Greg mastered it like last week and it's, you know, it's done. So, um, so I was lucky to find this place and the guy just left the door open. He had, 
he's one of the guys who's buying the UV wands because he was sanitizing a lot when I was there. Yeah. Um, so I've been working not like balls to the wall, but I've been, yeah, I've been getting shit done. And like Stuart said, I'm going out to Nashville uh, at the end of next week. Um, I mean, I got plenty of gloves and masks and I got, I bought extra sanitizer and wipes and I'm just going to be wiping shit down constantly. You know, with, with a full band, a full band record. Yeah. It's this guy on the 30 Tigers, Parker Millsap. So it's him and his bass player and drummer. And then a, a lot of it is just going to be me and him. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure how we're going to do the tracks. I told him no hugs or anything. And, you know, we're just going to keep far away. And like I said, I'm, I have a lot of wipes and just I'm going to try to wipe shit down constantly and, and a lot of Purell, like use hand sanitizer. So. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, honestly, like the, the, the Nashville studios took the bookings like two months ago or whatever. Like nobody seemed to be fussed about it. Um, so I booked the time and I never got a call saying, well, we're not sure. You know, it's like it seems like it's business as usual down there. Um, yeah, a friend of mine from Austin um, is flying up to Nashville to make a record next month. So I don't. He told me that I was like, oh, well, shit. yeah, <laughs> but but, the, but, but there was a definite. I mean, there's no way I was flying, but that's also by necessity. I'm bringing guitars and microphones and stuff like that. So but uh, even if I wasn't, I wouldn't fly. I would just drive. Fuck it, you know. So just a question, because we're kind of coming up on our time. But there was a Facebook one here uh, for Adrian. Uh, just uh, in terms of the record that you guys just made, if the band decided to record another record with the same jam session approach, would you do anything different next time? No. Nothing. Have them learn the yeah. song first. Yeah. <laughs> You can take a direct on that. Adrian, Adrian, was that the was that the long answer? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, no, it was basically just the setup from the record. Right. I mean, so you were all everything was everything was blown out. The mics were all. It was ready to go. Ready the, to go. The whole vibe on the whole record, anyway, was that. Yeah. I don't think, like I said, I don't think Steve wore headphones, so it was. I forgot that. was in the room and it was a, it's a little bit of isolation but if you if you didn't want to wear headphones you didn't have to How, so it's possible with a jam that long and that many mics and instruments could you have run out of tape oh uh <laughs> i don't know okay so next Maybe. time you guys make sure you get that big ass everybody drive. drive when they show up <laughs> What do you, I mean, we did do the record 88 too, right? Yeah. So, but we still, we, we weren't, that wasn't, we didn't, that wasn't like crazy big, was it? You, you finished, you finished with it when you cleaned it up. Was it, how many gig was it at the end of the day? Probably. Whole deal? Yeah. Well, I, I just copied the jam. So I, I wasn't working off the whole thing anymore. Right. Okay. Gotcha. <clears throat> I was trying to keep it down. Yeah. 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 yeah gotcha. So we did. As my dad always says, tape is cheap now. Is it really? <laughs> no, <laughs> hard to space yet. Oh yeah, gotcha. How was your dad? Good. He's good. He just texted me and said the studio is, is thirty by forty. Dot dot dot. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I knew it was too small. I mean, yeah. Well, tell tell him I said hi. <laughs> yeah. He's obviously listening, so you can just say hi now. <laughs> hey, Bruce. <laughs> so um before we uh before we wind up anybody anything anything we missed or anything we want to talk about uh, I, I don't know i i know i have to get in my car and start driving back to las vegas now so i can't really hang out too much longer but. <laughs> i i mean i would i would say that we that you know what we did with the record was kind of like, I mean, kind of like what I compared to a couple of things like the, the early 70s Miles Davis records where his band would just jam and then later on Miles and Tio Macero would shape it into something. And it really was, as Jason said, we we knew we liked that, but this is like the first time we actually gave ourselves the freedom to work that way. And it's kind of exciting. It's kind of a, it's kind of liberating to work that way. Just, you know, I mean, it's hard. I think when we do get back together again in the studio, I guarantee if we say, let's do it the same way again, 
it won't be the same way because it never is. Yeah. But it's nice, right. it's, nice, it's nice knowing that anything you do is a raw material for something else to happen. That's, that's exciting. Right. Yes, the stars were must have been aligned in some way because I was I had just come off of making a record very similarly to when Steve wrote me this email about this idea to cut this record up. I had just done this very similar thing with uh, my friend Matt White, and we just took all these long jams and made these other songs out of it. And I was like, sure, I'm ready to. I mean, I just feel like I was in that headspace already, so it kind of gave it. I feel like a little bit of a leg up because it. I think it, we were already in sync a little bit. Steve, what was it like like writing vocal melodies against the harmonic nature of what you had? Was that kind of a, was that a challenge or was it easy? Oh yeah, big challenge, but fun. It was kind of like, you know, it took a lot of time and just seeing where things landed and listening to, because the funny thing is, I think that because we all come from a song structure background, what everybody played was almost with a certain kind of logic to where things would happen. So it was amazing when you listen to the record, a drum fill will happen where a chorus should be starting. And Chris will, Chris will repeat a line on keyboards four, four times. So that must be the intro to the song, things like that. I think just instinctively we all did. So I had to look for a lot of that kind of thing to find the patterns, find the changes and fit in a song into where all those things happen. But it, it was there. Beautiful. It, it took a while. It wasn't yeah. easy. I think if you want the next time you do one of these records really quick, you should just have Steven show up with um, mushrooms. <laughs> and then that'll, that'll give you a little leg up on the next jam record. This is a good idea. <laughs> well, I think it's good advice just to, to, not that really anyone needs advice, but for younger bands, any bands to go into a studio, I mean, you don't have to do it all day long or all night long, but occasionally forget the regular song structure and just go out and play. <laughs> And you have no idea where it's going to go, and you might end up with some happy accidents. Cool stuff. Sure, I agree. H nine with you. Good advice, Steve. Make sure to have your H nine with you at all times. <laughs> so funny. Just all right, well, great. So, guys, really awesome, and um, that was really a blast. Stay well. Stay in touch. <laughs> and. Uh, We'll see you guys down the road, right? Yeah, right. Oh, there he goes. I'm going. Mark. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark traveled, bro, back to Las Vegas. Right, thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. guys. Thanks, Wonderful to see you. It's really great, thanks, everybody. Buddy. Vita Zane. Bye, guys. Vita Zane, baby. I'll be the same. Um, I, I don't know if we're off or